Welcome to this week's episode of Talk of the Town. My name is Philip Swiskid, and I am back with my good friend, Dr. Kenneth Harper from Vein Specialist of the South, coming to you live from the Daybreak Day Resource Center in beautiful downtown Macon, Georgia. Daybreak helps over 100 homeless people each and every day, and we're gonna talk about that in just a minute. But first, for those of you joining us on WMGT, Thanks so much for welcoming us into your home this week. Here's what you can expect from us every Saturday morning at 8.30. A conversation between myself, Dr. Harper, and someone in the community that is a, about advancing middle Georgia. This week is no exception. We're joined by Jeff Batcher. Jeff, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. It's very nice y'all to have me. So Jeff, you're a longtime Maconite. You were, you were here and it sounds like that you did some work in some other places and you ended up coming back to the middle Georgia area to do a lot of uh, community service work. Tell us a little bit about your story. Well, Macon is my hometown. I was born here um, at the old Macon Hospital, which now is, let's see, Navicent Atrium now. <laughs> so um, born there, grew up over in East Macon next to uh, Lake Arrowhead, if people know where that's at. So. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, my upbringing was something, um, my childhood was nothing I'd rather, ever really care to live through again. It wasn't a great childhood. So I think that really set the stage for me of all the things I've done now is that, you know, be, be frank, alcoholic father, uh, mother, you know, couldn't find work. So um, had people that came to the house to pick up the furniture. You know, I remember when mom went to get the, get the government cheese. You know, we all remember that. So that kind of set the stage for me of, what life could be like and how things could be very difficult in someone's life. So I was fortunate to um, have some good mentors in sports and so um, got a football scholarship at the University of Utah, lettered in football and baseball in Utah, and then came back to Macon, was a sportscaster here for six years on Channel 24 with the infamous Ron Wildman. Mm -hmm. And um, from there, I um, was lucky enough to uh, get a job at Bell South Mobility. I actually walked in the door when they were starting to sell cell phones. So wow. the old car phones, remember those oh, big yeah. bag phones and all those? <laughs> so worked my way up through Bell South uh, until I was eventually reporting to the CEO and responsible for all global public relations. And then did the same thing for Delta Airlines, reporting to the CEO there responsible for, you know, internal, external, financial comms, all those things. Um, and then did a stint out in Colorado for a couple years for a friend of mine who needed some help at level three, the long haul fiber company. But um, Macon was always drawing me home. You know, we, I've always had my house that my bride and I have had for years there, but I always wanted to come back. And so then about 10 years ago, I said, look, I'm done, you know, from doing the corporate stuff. Mm. And because what's the old saying from the Forrest Gump, you know, movie, there's only so much money a man needs and the rest is just for showing off, <laughs> you know? So, and I got nobody to show off to. And so I really wanted to get involved in the community and, um, and this is what I've done, and this is what I'm passionate about. Still do a good bit of consulting work. I'm very fortunate to do a lot of work with Amazon. But this is really what I spend 60% of my time on is mm -hmm. the nonprofit um, endeavors. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, Jeff, I've always uh, respected you for your commitment to serving others and really low-key service behind the scenes, a lot of it. And we see you on TV sometimes handing out the food for those people who need food or other things we'll talk about today. But... I really admire you for that. And one of our goals and what we're our discussion today is that would inspire other people to be get to be involved in things they're passionate about. And some of the people watching today are gonna to be passionate about the things that you're involved with, and that would be step alongside what you're doing to help make a difference. So thank you so much for that. And that's our goal today. And you have great. a great story and we look forward to uh, you sharing it with us. Great, glad to do it. So we're sitting here today in the Daybreak Day Resource Center, um, who, again, as we talked about earlier, and as you were telling me before we began, that they actually serve up to 100 homeless people each and every day, right. literally right here where we're standing. Yes. And it's not a, an, an actual homeless center. It sounds like it's just a resource center for people to be able to come in. Can you tell us a little bit about that and about sure. your passion for helping the homeless? Sure, so this is a day resource center. And again, 100 people a day come through here, and the purpose of this facility is to have individuals to get them off the street for the day and to get a hot shower. This is one of the only facilities here in town where you can get a hot shower, um, get your clothes washed. You know, people always say, well, why don't they get a job? Well, don't you think it'd be a good idea if they could take a shower and maybe get their clothes washed if they want to go and apply for a job? It helps. Yeah. It helps, yeah. So this is what this facility does. There's also uh, medical care that happen happens here. We've just started mental health care as well. Uh, we have a dentist that comes in. They can get counseling here. 
So this is a complete day resource center to provide you know, our homeless brothers and sisters who don't have any other avenue to go to, who are sleeping out on the river this way, sleeping under the bridge, to give them some dignity and to help them get out of homelessness. That's yeah. our ultimate goal, is to get them out of homelessness. Um, and it's a tough job, I can just tell you. 10 years ago when I started getting involved, I thought, oh, come on, how hard could it be to you know, get somebody out of homelessness? Yeah. Let me tell you, this is a tough thing to do. It takes so many different organizations to be involved because 80% of, again, our homeless brothers and sisters have mental health issues or they have substance abuse issues or many times both. And, you know, I'm always about being honest about this. So we've got to find a way for the, to help those 80%. And it's not a panacea. There's no easy way. Each individual takes a lot of work to get them placed in housing. So this facility provides a great um, resource, as does Lowe's and Fishes, as does the Rescue Mission, as does Mulberry, all of us working together to help the homeless. And it's a full-time job. But Daybreak provides that. It's been here about, it'll be 10 years this coming uh, next year. It uh, provides that great resource for those in need on a day-to-day -day basis. Do you have any quick stories of someone that came in here homeless and through a resource center like this, they were able to get back up on their feet and they're gainfully employed now and life has totally turned around? Absolutely. There are several individuals that this has happened to um, that have come through that are now um, working. There's a gentleman who came through this who, was, um, uh, who lost his job. Um, the very quick story on this, he, um, his name, well, first of all, I met this gentleman here, right? And we were getting ready for our sleep out, which I know we'll talk about in a minute. And I walked up and I saw him and I said, well, hey, thanks for helping us get set up. He was helping us that day. And he said, my name is Carlton. I just want to tell you that, you know, Daybreak's really helped me a lot. And I'm pretty sure I'm going to be on my feet soon. Thank you for everything. An hour later, I saw him and I said, Carlton, thanks for everything you're doing. He was keeping the fires going because it gets cold for here. And he started crying. And I said, what's wrong? And he said, no one's called me by my name in months. Because when you're homeless, you're a bum, you're nobody. Thank you wow. for calling me my name. Wow. So that's what this facility does. And that's what treating people with dignity. You know, and if there's anything anybody can understand about homelessness, most people don't want to be friggin' homeless, okay? Yeah. It happens for a myriad of reasons. And, and it's not that, and most of the time it's because someone doesn't have the resources that you and I have. Someone may have made a huge mistake. Maybe they got a DUI, but then they get put in jail. They can't pay it. They have no lawyer and they're in jail. They lose their job. Next thing you know, they're homeless. So it's, it's not as easy as people think to get out of homelessness, but it's pretty easy to get in. And so our goal is to try to stop people that are going to homelessness. And then if they do find themselves, let's give them some dignity and help them get out of homelessness. This place is driven by donations. I mean, y'all might get some foundation. It might be some foundation money and we appreciate that, but yeah. what's the biggest fundraiser of the year that you have? Right, and it's the sleep out that I just mentioned a minute ago, and this will be the ninth right. year that we've had uh, the sleep out. And it's such a unique, um, we actually got the idea from Australia. The Australians did this and it was a CEO sleep out. And so there's not a, not a lot of CEOs <laughs> that make it. So we opened it up to anybody. Yeah. So um, last year we had about 100, 125 people that come out and sleep in solidarity for one night mm -hmm. with the homeless. And I would encourage you, if y'all ever want to do it or anybody else out there that wants right. to do this, it's amazing. You're in your tent for that one night and you hear the noise, you hear the trains, you hear some gunshots in the distance, and you're thinking, how does somebody that is homeless do this every single night? And you're doing it just for one night. Mm -hmm. And it really gives you that solidarity. And we ask people to raise $1,000. And so people, you know, give us $1,000 for the privilege of sleeping outside in the cold <laughs> for one night. But last year, we raised $230,000. $230,000 for a one event. And that helps Daybreak. Um, about 45 to 50% of our expenses are paid by that one event. Okay. It's huge. Wow. It's hey, huge. It's cold in February. And it's yeah, cold in February. It maybe cold. <laughs> yeah, maybe yeah, cold. Probably is. Last year it wasn't. Three years ago there was ice on the outside <laughs> of, of my tent. And I'm like, what in the world? Yeah. But you know, but you think about how does somebody do this every single yeah. night? Right. How right. does that happen? Uh -huh. How do you do that? Uh -huh. You know, and what can we do to help them? So right. it's, 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 it, the money is fantastic, but it's more of that having a little compassion the next time right. you see somebody that's homeless if you'll sleep out for one night. So if you want to do uh, sleep out, which is coming up pretty yep. soon, how do, you, how do you do that? Sure. You can go to makingsleepout.com. Makingsleepout.com. Okay. Go to that and you can register and sleep out or you can find someone 
that's sleeping out and donate to their page. Okay. So if you're not quite ready to take that step yeah. to sleep, you can help someone right. else raise their money. Well, I'll tell you something else very quickly. Right. Last year, because of COVID, we also did um, virtual sleeping. So you could okay. sleep at home if you wanted to. Now, if you slept outside <laughs> all night long or not, we don't know. We're not checking on you. But we did do that last year and it was really huge. And so we put a sign up in your yard that said, you know, sleeping outside virtually for the, um, for daybreak, uh -huh. um, the make and sleep out dot com, blah, blah, blah. So right. we had 40 or 50 people that did that last year. So, oh. you know, uh, that's an option as well. All so right. you can help us there. If you don't want to come down here, you can sleep remotely. When I, when I read your resume, you're part of uh, DePaul USA and part of the uh, FanWin. Family of Vincentians. Right. It's called FanVim. Yeah. So DePaul USA is a, a US-based focus on homelessness, but the other one's worldwide. Tell us, how'd you get involved with those? and what did you learn from those that you brought back to make and to help out us out here? Right. So I'm, I'm, I'm a volunteer here at Daybreak, right? right? And so Daybreak is part of DePaul USA. And so they asked me to be on the board, I guess, because I was probably annoying them on ideas and things I have. I, <laughs> I, I had that way of, you know, saying, look, here's why we can fix things and make more money and right. uh, help our help our brothers and sisters that are homeless more. So I'm on the board of DePaul USA. We're in seven cities. Um, and so we have another day center in uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, uh, facilities in New Orleans, we're in Philadelphia, we're in Chicago, um, we're in St. Louis, and the two new projects we've just started are homeless college students, which people don't realize, it's a big issue. And so we've got one at St. John's University in New York we just started, and then one at DePaul University in Chicago. Hmm. So, and we're about to, in January of next year, we'll be opening up a day resource center like this, that much bigger in Los Angeles. Wow. So it's going to be a massive because homelessness is a big problem there. And what helps us out a lot is the Daughters of Charity. Um, and like Sister Teresa that runs this facility, she doesn't take a salary. Hmm. So hmm. there's no money going to this facility that goes to executives right. pay. This hmm. money, all the money stays here in Macon and no one's getting a salary here. She doesn't take one. And the Daughters of Charity for the West Coast um, are going to help us fund that and, and start that facility there. And what's so amazing about DePaul USA is that I'm not Catholic. Right. And you know, they let a heathen like me be involved, <laughs> you know, because I'm passionate about homelessness yeah. and getting stuff yeah. done. Uh -huh. So it's a great organization um, that's doing good work. And I'll tell you, you asked about um, what I've learned. And then part of the global uh, organization, the Family of Vincentians, I'm what I think they call a commissioner on that. It's trying to organize all the Vincentians. There's, um, 230 different Vincentian organizations in 150 different countries, trying to get them all organized mm. um, on giving us stats on homelessness so we can go to the Bill Gates Foundation, you know, and ask for a couple million dollars. Right. So it's been hard to get all those things organized, but I've been able to tour different facilities. And one of the most interesting ones um, is in Ireland where they've got what they call a wet center. It's called the Sundial facility where they don't care if you drink there, but they were having a problem with so many homeless people who were alcoholics dying on the street, freezing to death there. So they opened up this wet center. So in essence, you walk in and if you've got your bottle of vodka, your beers, you give it to them, they put your name on it. You know, here's Jeff's beer, blah, blah, blah. They put it in the refrigerator. Yeah. Anytime you want a beer, you get it. Um, and you've got good food to eat and a clean, safe place to sleep. The amount of people who have stopped drinking or reduced their drinking considerably is higher there than in any program that we've ever seen. Wow. Because they've got a somebody that cares about them. Counseling is involved in this as well. But it's interesting. I don't know if we could ever do that here in the buckle of the Bible belt so anybody would support that. But it's just a way to make my brain work differently. There's different ways to solve problems. It's not always the same way. And that's a way to get homeless individuals off the street and let them not die in the snow. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. but I think it shows that 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 organization just deeply cares for the homeless. You Absolutely. know, they're not, they're not trying to flip a switch and, and, and fix a problem They're They actually care about that person. Absolutely. And I have been um, so honored to be involved and again, learn so much, um, you know, been to Rome, been to Paris, had the opportunity to be in the room uh, with the Pope um, when. Uh, there was the 500 year anniversary of St. Vincent de Paul and to be wow. in the same room, you know, with the Pope, you're like, wow, that's, that's, kind, of the, that's, that's yeah. kind of a big deal, you yeah. know? Yeah. 
So, you know, poor kid from Macon, Georgia is in the same room with the puddle. Like, yeah, you know. I think that is a big deal. Yeah. So, you know, Macon, especially downtown Macon, has seen just a, a, a boom in economic activity in the past few years. We've been so blessed. However, one of the things that's come along with that is the cost of housing downtown has yeah. gone up exponentially. Right before the show started, we were talking, and you said that the average uh, one-bedroom apartment is $1,600 a month right. now. And you and some other people have gotten together, and you all have a plan to implement some affordable housing that's going to be right out the window here. Yep. Can you tell us about that? Sure. Uh, let me tell you, this is this is super exciting. I know I get excited about a lot of things, but, <laughs> but, this, but this is really a big deal. Um, there's been no affordable housing in downtown Macon in years, probably since the Dempsey. So the, I'm a commissioner on the Macon Housing Authority and also on DePaul USA. So what's helpful about being on all these different boards is not to be on them, but to see how you can help and kind of play that three-dimensional chess and see where we also talked about earlier, why everybody's doing this, but no one can see the bigger picture. So I, I kind of, not that it makes me look like I'm really smart here, but I can look at the bigger picture on what's happening. So went to the, went to the housing authority, um, went to DePaul, and we're gonna have a very unique co collaboration between the housing authority and DePaul USA. We're gonna build an 82 bed facility, affordable housing, that a one bedroom is gonna be $600 as opposed to six, $1,600. Wow. Um, and this is the first one that we know about anywhere in the United States. Mike Austin at the Housing Authority um, is fantastic. Hmm. And he has investigated and knows all the housing authorities across the country. And to our knowledge, there's been no collaboration like this anywhere. Hmm. It's a very unique one where again, a nonprofit and a housing authority work together. $20 million facility. And as part of this, we're gonna have a 10 bed respite which Daybreak is going to own and pay for. It's $2.25 million. We've already raised $2 million. We've already got $2 million raised for this facility. Wow. We're gonna break ground in January. So this mm. is not a pipe dream. We're thinking about it, or as we say in the South, fixing to. Um, this, <laughs> right. thing is, this thing is gonna happen. So okay? in 30 days. In 30 days, live. we're gonna be, we're going live. Because wow. we've already gone through and got all the tax, uh, tax credits to the Department of Community Affairs. This thing is, is gonna happen. Right. And this respite is really so important because and I don't want to disparage any of the hospitals because they've got rules of how many days someone can stay there. And you know this, Doc, right. about someone comes in, you can only because Medicare or Medicaid, whatever, they you know, have to go. We don't see people in hospital gowns right. out in front of here mm. who have just got discharged from the hospital. And then, you know, we don't have any way to really treat them. We've got a medical clinic here, but we don't have their medicines or those types of things. So they go back, back living on the river. Mm. They get infected. They're mm. back in the hospital costing them money. So Atrium is working with us and Piedmont is working with us and they're gonna fund, help fund the day-to-day -day operations. We're gonna build the facility. So when someone gets discharged that has no place to go, that is homeless, they can come here in this respite, have a registered nurse, make sure their wounds are cleaned and make sure they take their medicines mm -hmm. and they're not back in the hospital. Mm -hmm. So this will be the only one that we're aware of anywhere in the area. So 12 bed respite, 82 bed affordable housing, um, 16 of those beds will be for Section 8 housing for Daybreak as well. So mm -hmm. a unique opportunity to really help. And by the way, the business community has been asking for this. Mm -hmm. You know, they really wanted us right. to do this because waiters, waitresses, um, police officers, LPNs at the hospital, they right. can't afford to live downtown. Mm -hmm. Now they can walk right. to work, mm -hmm. yeah. you know? So this is, um, is gonna be a unique opportunity, I think, and really gonna be benefiting making. Right. So last December, there were a couple of homeless men that, that died outside yeah. here in Macon. And that spurred some activity that I think made a difference, the warming yeah. center. I don't, were you, you may not have been directly involved with that, but we saw some things and we hear a lot of positive things. Yep. It was big and it was tragic. It was Christmas Day. Yeah. Two um, gentlemen froze to death. I right. sent a text to Lester Miller and I said, we can't have this happen again. We're better than this. We cannot let this happen in our mm -hmm. town. That's before Lester was mayor yet, right? Um, He'd been elected, I, but maybe not installed. Or just, that is correct. It was yeah. December. So he, yeah. he took over in January. Yeah. So, um, because it just, I mean, how, how do you let this happen? How do you let two people die? And right. so he called me immediately back and we talked and he said, I'm going to do something about this. Hmm. He said, um, I've got the Brookdale Warming Center. You know, he was on the school board and we talked a lot, asked questions, and then he got a lot of other people involved. So I don't want to overstate yeah. my importance in this in any way, right. shape or form. But um, we talked and I gave him some, I was like, here, here's what I think is going to work. Here's what I think is not going to work. Here's what we've tried at daybreak that's work. Here's what we've tried at daybreak that doesn't work. Here's what I've seen that works in St. Louis that didn't work, blah, blah, yeah. blah. So, but he took the ball and ran with this and implemented this. 
And it's something that's needed to help, again, get people on that path to get them housed. So it's a fantastic facility. I think just like the initiative here, uh, the mayor said that people are calling around the country and said, how did you do that in a matter of a few weeks? Yeah. And it was a passion for something and willing to get out there and a community support. Exactly. Broad community support, which made a big difference. That's exactly right. He has just done, I think, a wonderful right. job. And that was the first initiative because he really cares about this. And right. when you care about something, you you won't find any barriers. You find right. a way to get it done. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and so you do. You just find a way and you get yeah. it done. So, you know, hunger in middle Georgia and really everywhere is just really difficult to see. And so it's one of those things that it's, it's, it's kind of hard to know how many people are struggling with this. Do you have any numbers for the middle Georgia area for how many people are struggling with hunger? So I'm on the board of the Middle Georgia Community Food Bank and was the chairman of the board in 2020. And the estimates that we have on the 24 counties that we serve is there are 100,000 people in the middle Georgia area that are food insecure on a daily basis. How many people? 100,000. Out of... How many, what's the total population? So the total population, um, I don't know if I know that off the top of my head of the, of the 24 counties, but um, it's- That's a significant you know, number, it's 100,000. A, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a significant number. Right. And it's one of those things that we've got to battle with every day. Hmm. And the, again, the food bank, 24 counties, 170 um, food um, organizations that we work with uh, in the 24 counties. I mean, keep in mind, I mean, we're from Telfair County to Lamar County. Wow. I mean, you know, so we're so you've I mean, got a big, so it's big a big race. geographical area right. with, you know, in essence, 18 employees, you know, that have to cover this whole area. Um, during uh, 2019, I again took over board chair in 2020 and 2019, we served 8.6 million meals in the 24 counties. Hmm. In 2020, it was 10.1 million meals. So 10 million meals we helped distribute in the 24 county area. And you remember the long lines and the distribution right. that we had right. and everything. Um, it's, uh, it's a real problem. And, and, and what was so humbling during the pandemic and these massive food distributions was to see people that you knew, you know, sometimes that were small business owners, you know, people that owned restaurants and all of that. So it was a very mm -hmm. difficult time. And right now we're trending, we're about 8.8 .8 million meals as of right now. So we'll probably mm -hmm. end up probably at about 9 million meals through the mm -hmm. end of this year. So it's trending down about a million meals, but still 2020 was quite a year. We couldn't have done it without the National Guard. They came in and helped us um, mm -hmm. at the food bank to help distribute food and the like. But um, food insecurity is still a major issue. And, and again, those are things I try to focus on. You know, there's people in the academia that can figure all the big things out, right. but let's get somebody housed, let's get them fed. And that's kind of the basics right. of life, yeah. you yeah. know? Uh, let's not worry about, you know, red or right. blue or any other stuff. Let's get right. somebody in the house and let's get somebody some food. So where, how do you, get 10 million meals. I mean, how does the Middle Georgia Food Bank, how does that happen? Right. Yeah, so- and how does the community help with that happen? Yeah, those 170 partners that we've got, so it's from the faith-based community, the churches in the rural areas, it's Meals on Wheels, it's the Rescue Mission, Daybreak is an agency, as we call them, right. of uh, the Middle Georgia Community Food Bank. So uh, Kathy McCollum has been a year and a half now, the new president of the food bank. And what she's done a fantastic job on is getting more of these agencies because you want to get the food closer to the people. Mm. It doesn't make sense on an ongoing basis to take a truck from Altmogee East Boulevard mm -hmm. and take it down to Dublin, Georgia and tell everybody to come to one location. You right, know, a lot right. of people don't have transportation. So you've got to set up these food pantries. Uh, and that's what we've done to, with different places. So you can say, Monday at two o'clock to four o'clock, come to this church. Then on Wednesdays, you can go here in East Dublin and find food. And you can go to the, um, there's two places. Uh, 211 can tell you where they'd like, your, give them your zip code, they'll give you the closest food pantry. Or you can go to the United Way website or the food, Middle Georgia Community Food Bank website, and there's an interactive map that you can just push so, that you're closest location. So she need food. What do you do if you, if you find yourself needing food? So 211, call 211 or go right. to the website of the Middle Georgia Community Food Bank and there's an, and there's an interactive map okay. that'll show you, the, show you the closest location for you to get food. Okay. And so just like 911, you literally dial 211 and yes. it connects you? Yes, you dial 211 on your phone and it can help with all manner of different services. So if you're food insecure, um, if you need housing, um, if you're um, a medical, if you're if in the military, you need military help. So 211 is a great resource that United Way has done a fantastic job on. So you, you serve on the United Way and the Boys and Girls Club too. Right. And that kind of dovetails with your mission. Tell us how that all kind of uh, 
measure together? Sure. So, you know, George McCandless is just the, has done a fantastic job at the United Way. Right. I mean, what he's done since he's come and taken over um, of getting involved in the community. In the past, United Ways, if you've worked at a large corporation, it was you gave money to United Way, United Way got the money, and they passed it back out to their respective agencies. He's got involved now and done so many things with Volunteer United, the reading program, which has just been so helpful to so many young mm -hmm. kids. Um, Mission United, helping veterans. Right. So, I mean, you know, you, you hear a story from a veteran who says, I was on the verge of committing suicide if it wasn't for this program. George has just done a great job. So I'm honored to be a trustee of the United Way because, again, helps me see all the different organizations, what they're doing, and to make sure that we're all just not necessarily staying in our swim lane. Right. I, I like to say that, you know, we're all in our swim lane. We're doing a good job, but there's people in the pool that are drowning. You know, right. we can't just stay in our, the nonprofits, the churches, the governments. We've all got to start working on these larger problems like right. poverty. Yeah. The poverty rate is 30 percent here in middle Georgia. Yeah. The state of Georgia poverty rate is 19 percent, 30 percent poverty. Right. What the hell are we doing about this? You know, why do we just keep talking about it? I mean, all, we, should, we should be organized. And that's what George is doing. He's got a poverty initiative. We can try to get somebody out of systemic poverty. It's just mm -hmm. it's one of those things we just cannot let continue. So anyway, sorry, a little passionate about this stuff. But I mean, you know, it's that, one of those things we, we that's just true. It, it, it's it's not it's not insolvable. Right. It's one of those things we can help with. It takes vision and it takes leadership. Yeah. And without vision and leadership, people are lost. Yeah. Right. So we've been fortunate to have a number. You've mentioned uh, half a dozen people that have vision and leadership right now. So we're in a sweet spot right now to make a difference. I think you're right. Thank you so much for joining us this week for this very special conversation. If you want to hear more about what we've discussed, there's actually a much longer clip that's available. It's on our Facebook page and our YouTube page. We hope you will check that out. Thank you so much. See you soon. I work in inventory management, requiring a lot of walking and standing on concrete. After many years, my legs were bulging and swollen and embarrassing, and I hated to wear shorts or even a bathing suit. Plus, I'm a mom. I'm very active and love shopping and outdoor activities. My legs got worse over the years, and I was having trouble sleeping because my legs ached and they were restless. Hearing great things about vein specialists of the South, I called and made an appointment. Plus, it was covered on my insurance. An ultrasound showed my legs were even worse than I thought. The staff were very caring and professional, and I loved the way the doctor talked to me during my procedure, explaining everything. This made me feel completely comfortable the entire time. And the best part, there was little downtime and I could feel a difference in my legs immediately. If you're having vein issues and ready to improve the quality of your life, I highly recommend calling Vein Specialists of the South today.